Hi, welcome to this week's Property Insider video. Today, Dr. Andrew Wilson and I discuss the proposed relaxation of lending criteria that some people are wondering is going to fuel our property markets or create significant debt for consumers that they're not going to be able to cope. Of course, as always, Dr. Andrew Wilson brings some sense to this argument. We're also going to talk about what's happening to our property markets around Australia. And an interesting report from Westpac that consumer sentiment is high, but some people are worried maybe the property market's moved up too fast too quickly. If you want to keep up to date with our regular property commentary, please subscribe to this YouTube channel and click the little bell icon so you're up to date every time we bring out a new show. Property prices have continued rising around Australia. We're well on track for double digit growth this year, with some markets likely to achieve this much sooner than the end of the year. And that's meant a sense of FOMO, fear of missing out, continues to be a major factor spurring housing markets across the country as buyer demand well outweighs house supply. Auction clearance rates remain high, in fact, at unprecedented levels in our capital cities. And the next test for the resilience of our markets is going to be when auction volumes step up a bit further. But making the news this week has been the fact that the Senate's Economic Legislation Committee has backed the repeal of responsible lending obligations. And not surprisingly, the media's had a field day with this. One of the headlines I read was, axing responsible lending will throw petrol on the housing bonfire. Another reported, so disappointing, consumer advocates slash responsible lending inquiry findings. And yet another, repealing responsible lending laws will hurt consumers. Well, if you're wondering what all this is about, you're going to enjoy my discussion with Dr. Andrew Wilson today. He's Australia's leading housing economist, but he's going to explain what all this means, as well as giving us his insights into what's happening in the housing markets. Hi, Andrew. Yes, hello, Michael. And just another very interesting week in property, hasn't it been? It has. There's always news in the property market. And before we get into what this responsible lending means, is it going to be the beginning of a boom, the end of consumerism? Let, let's see. Before we get into that, let's just have a talk about how the housing markets are going. And each week we discuss the property auction results because they're a good indicator of what's happening on the ground, Andrew. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. And we're almost getting a little blase about these strong results weekend through weekend. And it was no exception last weekend. In fact, Sydney broached the 90% clearance rate again. That's the second time in three weeks. And it was a record high from the My Housing Market series, over 90%. And uh, we also had very, very strong results again in Canberra and Adelaide and Melbourne was up over 80% again. So really there's no weak link in the market, even though the Brisbane clearance rates were down. Historically there, it's very, very high levels still. And numbers, you mentioned auction numbers, numbers were up at the weekend. Of course, there was the return of the Melbourne market and the Canberra market after a holiday shutdowns the week before. Shouldn't use that word shutdown, but holiday breaks the week before. But now we're working up as you said, Michael, to the Super Saturday of auctions, which will occur the weekend before Easter in a fortnight's time. There will be a very big load of auctions conducted, particularly in Melbourne. We may see the all-time record for the number of auctions conducted on a Saturday broken in Melbourne in a fortnight's time. So it'll certainly test the market, but you'd have to be pretty brave to suggest that we wouldn't continue to see these strong clearance rates. Buyer appetite is very, very strong at the moment. But the auction markets are, are still pointing to clearly a boom environment for house prices. And just on house prices, Michael, as you mentioned, I track house prices in real time, as you know. And just as an instance of that, uh, I can tell that a reveal that the Sydney market so far this year has had prices growth of just over 4%. Now, we're not at the end of the March quarter yet, and we may even get a 5% growth rate given those auction clearance rates uh, for house prices in Sydney over the March quarter. So we've gone a quarter of the way through the year and we're approaching halfway towards that 10% increase that we've predicted. So I think it will ease through then, but certainly the early part of this year is very strong. Interesting also, Michael, that unit prices are also up just over 2% over the quarter so far this year in Sydney. So uh, the unit market's not missing out either. So we shouldn't be surprised strong auction clearance rates to continue. Big tests in the market over the next fortnight with higher listing numbers on that Super Saturday weekend. And But uh, you'd be very brave to predict that we won't still see 
very strong buyer activity. It's unlikely we're going to have a change in auction clearance rates for a while, but some people are worried that this is going to be fueled by changing lending criteria. So, Andrew, let me first explain what I believe responsible lending is to help our viewers understand that. And then I'd like you to correct me if I'm wrong, but also tell me what you think the changes are going to be. Because how I see it is that in the past, the National Consumer Protection Act set out how lenders must act when assessing loan applications. Essentially, it means that lenders can only give money to a borrower if they can handle the money responsibly. They've got to ensure that the credit product is suitable. Now, we had that Haynes Royal Commission a while ago that was a bit of a furphy. I know you've got some strong opinions on that. But the lender is meant to make reasonable inquiries about the applicant's requirements, their objectives, and then they've also got to take steps to verify their financial situation. And these Rules were introduced in 2009 following the global financial crisis when around the world finance markets were imploding. Then at the end of last year, in the midst of COVID, the government decided to amend those regulations and their argument was they wanted to reduce red tape, make credit more easy. They wanted to boost the economy because we know that property and in fact the general economy is based on the availability of finance. But since they brought that in, Andrew, all those suggestions, the economy's rebounded, job growth surged, our housing markets are booming. And it's said that there's going to be a debate in the Senate shortly, but the Senate Economics Legislation Committee reported that they wanted to back these changes. They said, and I'm quoting them, the committee notes that a well-functioning credit market is essential for economic growth generally and for Australia's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The report went on to say the committee agrees that the current consumer credit protection framework is potentially overprescriptive and that a regulatory duplication between the responsible lending applications, the Credit Act, and the potential standards issued by APRA could be an issue. In other words, Andrew, they were concerned that our current framework has resulted in consumers being unable to access loans in a, in a timely manner. So what are the proposed changes and what do you think this is going to mean, Andrew? Well, you, yeah, you're right, Michael. That's the, the essence of this. I mean, once we start talking about the end of responsible lending, we start thinking about the other end of that, and that's the introduction of irresponsible lending. And, of course, the media have had a, a wonderful time, and particularly consumer advocates, particularly predicting the usual doom and gloom as a result. But, look, this is a non-event. Let's be clear, the criteria for lending income and asset value. Now, the banks will... One of the secrets to Australia's successful housing markets is they have a very rigid financial sector. Banks uh, won't lend under most circumstances uh, more than 80% of their valuation of the property. And just on, on that, Michael, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence coming through, reports coming through, that banks are really pushing down valuations at the moment, well below a sale price level. So that's another factor that's reducing the risk of lending. But the other, of course, other than the asset value, the other factor is your income situation. And banks will typically not allow you to repay more than 25% of your income in your home loan. So that leaves you with 75% of your income for other expenses. So those things are obviously very easy to monitor and prove. Incomes have to be proved through your uh, taxation returns, whether you're a business or your group certificates. I don't think we have those anymore uh, <laughs> if you're an employee. And of course, banks will value themselves, as I've mentioned, the property. But the factor that's caused all the heat in this debate isn't to do with those very rigid standards, which will continue. And the Reserve Bank has said they will continue to make sure that the banks maintain those very strict standards. And as we've discussed a number of times, they won't vary because of all that, that market power that banks have. However, there is another issue which did come up in the Royal Commission, and that is the expenditure side of the equation in terms of your income. Now, we know that everybody has a different expenditure profile. Households typically can spend a lot different one to the other, depending on personal circumstances. Now, in the Royal Commission, the only thing that was really revealed in the Royal Commission, and there's a lot of rubbish being spouted that the Royal Commission revealed uh, lax lending from banks. Now, the only thing that was revealed was that the banks have been using a model to determine what the average expenditure is for a household. Now, there hasn't been really an issue with this other than the theoretical issue that, gee, why are we using a model? We should be asking people individually to prove what their expenditures are. 
Well, obviously, the difficulty with that is, Michael, is it can take a very long time to justify and validate what your expenditure is, you know, over what period, all these sort of bits and pieces. Now, as you said, with the previous legislation or the existing legislation, uh, the banks have the onus to do that, to actually justify. It's their responsibility to justify what the expenditure pattern is of the potential borrower. What's going to happen now is that's going to be shifted over to the consumer, that they will be responsible for providing that expenditure information in terms of the household budget. Now, the problems, as as the government so rightly identified, and as you said previously, is that this creates a lot of red tape because the banks have to assiduously examine what the expenditure performance is of their prospective uh, borrowers. Now, that's the red tape. Now, this can actually take or add months to the approval process of a loan. So we've sort of, what we're doing is accelerating that to make the consumer responsible for providing that expenditure information. So that will fast track the lending position for those applying for uh, home loans. Now, a couple of points. Firstly, this is really an owner-occupier initiative. Uh, Investors have a different, because they operate as a business, they have a different income profile. So it's not going to really impact investors, which as we've mentioned numerous times, are very low on the ground at the moment anyway. And we've seen that with these laws, you would have thought that the banks using this so-called model to accelerate the expenditure pattern of applicants, that we may have seen uh, some factors which showed that this wasn't working, and that would have been higher loan defaults or arrears numbers. Well, mortgage defaults and mortgage arrears are still remain very, very low. I noticed Fitch have come out and backtracked quite significantly on their predictions for defaults now. I mean, that's, that's a big club at the moment, those road to Damascus on the doom and gloomers from last year, Michael. But the, the ratings agency are, are acknowledging that we're likely to continue to see, even with the end of those mortgage holidays that have, that have been around for the last 12 months, that even with the end of that low levels of defaults, and arrear. So look, in a nutshell, Michael, this is not going to have it make any difference to our housing markets. It's not really going to produce one extra buyer. It's not going to put upward pressure on prices. All it's going to do is accelerate the home lending process. And there's plenty of reports around at the moment, Michael, with record numbers of owner occupiers, that banks are having significant problems in uh, servicing applications for home loans at the moment. And the real criteria that counts, and we know it counts because we haven't seen any variance in those issues of uh, arrears or defaults from the pattern of expenditure modelling that's being used, the process that's being used. The only issues are the LVRs, the loan to valuation uh, rate ratios, and of course, the income ratios as well. And they're not changing at all, Michael, and they're easy to prove. And this is just making this a more streamlined process. Won't have any impact at all on our housing markets, Michael, in my opinion. One of the factors people are suggesting is that when interest rates go up, because they are going to go up, Andrew, they keep telling us. I don't know. People are going to have trouble servicing the debt. The first question I'd ask is why should they go up? But the second is to remind them that in the models that the banks are using, they're already using higher than current interest rates to ensure you can service the loans, Andrew. Well, that's right, Michael. Do you know, Michael, when the last time we had an interest rate increase was? It's a decade since we have had that. So, and I think right now we're as far away from an interest rate increase as we've ever been in the modern cycle. So I'm not sure if it's going to take another 10 years to get sick of the debate about when interest rates (laughs) rise, et cetera, but you never know. We're in an era of clickbait and that's one of the, the, the best proven mechanisms for attracting attention to a headline higher. I'd like to finish off by discussing a recent Westpac Melbourne Institute consumer sentiment result. Interestingly, consumer sentiment is now at 10-year highs, and that's related to the fact that we've got COVID under control, the promise of vaccine rollouts, support from the government, jobs coming back. So overall, Australians are feeling much more confident about their future. What I did find interesting was that one of the questions I asked is, is this a good time to buy property? And while at the end of last year, the time to buy dwelling index peaked in November last year, Now people are starting to get a little bit more concerned and this consumer sentiment survey suggested that optimism over house prices is still surging, 
But the concern is that people have missed the mark and that now it's not the best time to buy properties anymore. I guess that fits in with what we're hearing that there's FOMO in the market, but it's not what we're seeing on the ground because you go to the auctions on the weekend, as we've already discussed, or open for inspections, and you're going to find there's a queue of people. So it's interesting the conclusion that Westpac drove, so it's interesting the conclusion Westpac came up with was that the resurgent prices are starting to dampen by interest, but boy, that's very different from what we're seeing on the ground. Well, look, these sentiment surveys tend to follow, not lead, Michael. So uh, I take them with a grain of salt. But obviously, as prices rise, people become less enthusiastic about entering the housing market. But this, we still have, I'll be releasing the My Housing Market Affordability Index for the March quarter shortly. And I think we'll find that affordability is starting to slip. And that's no surprise with higher prices and interest rates flat and incomes flat. But we still have significant growth, upside growth in demand in our property markets. Just another point to, I guess, to finish on, Michael, is I noticed there's been a lot of chat and everybody's got a theory about why the housing market's rising as it is at the moment, and most of them are wrong. But one of them is that we have an undersupply of property. Again, I, I can't quite see the logic in that. Too much demand, not enough supply. I think what we're seeing with this very high proportion of owner occupiers, we've got to remember that most of these not all of them, are changeover or change or changeover buyers. So they're basically swapping one house for the next. And when over 60% of the market is a changeover buyers, there's no change in supply or demand equilibrium. I mean, this is just nonsense stuff to suggest it's all about not enough houses out there, which I believe underlying housing supply is will eventually, when we get population growth happening again, will move to a shortage. But at the moment, it's just the churn of properties is so quick that supply disappears quickly as one buyer becomes a seller and one seller becomes a buyer. As I said, it is not about an undersupply of property that's pushing up prices. It is a catch-up energy, particularly Melbourne and Sydney, given high levels of affordability, which are set to decline. And even first-home buyers that don't have a trade-in, a lot of them are purchasing new properties, Michael, as a result of those government initiatives. And I guess the conclusion is, don't make your 30-year home buying or property investment decisions based on the last 30 minutes of news. Be That's careful right. who you listen to. The media is out there to, to scare us. So I look forward to catching up with you again next week and hearing some grounded advice. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Michael. 